etiquette. So when somebody gives you a popsicle, mom and dad say, what do you say? Thank you. <laughs> if you get a cookie, what do you say? Thank you. You know, these things. But this gospel is about a lot more than etiquette today. And it's really about different people recognizing the power of God better than the chosen people. Hmm. Look at the Old Testament reading. Let's consider that first. Naaman was a general. So think of a big war machine behind this guy coming down from Syria. And he's in the northern kingdom. And the northern kingdom is a little shaky and not very important. And so the king there gets really nervous for good reason. If you were a minor little country and some big shot general came to visit you, you'd be kind of nervous too. And he's afraid because... What if he doesn't get healed? What if Naaman doesn't get healed? Is he going to be mad at our little kingdom and come and invade and show our God that he can't do anything and blah, 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 blah. So what do you do when you're nervous and you're an ancient king? You call in the theologians. <laughs> so he called in the prophet, Elisha. And so this man is told to bathe in the Jordan seven times, which he thinks is ridiculous. And of course he does. I'll give you a local example, and some little geography too. In Syria, Damascus is really not that far from the mountains of Lebanon, and there are rushing streams coming down out of the mountains toward the city. You know, think of babbling brooks and trees and fresh flowing water and all that. They're lovely little streams. And Naaman knows about the Jordan, and he thinks, that? That's not a bubbling mountain stream. Here's a local example. Any of you seen the Little Colorado River up in the White Mountains? Maybe a few? It's beautiful, isn't it, up there? It's really pretty. Think of this little mountain stream rushing over the rocks with fir trees and aspens growing everywhere up there in eastern Arizona. It's really lovely. But what's that river like when it gets to Winslow? <laughs> well, at that point, it's about a half a mile wide, about an inch deep, and it's so full of muck that you could probably walk on it, okay? <laughs> Bathe in that? You know, Naaman's thinking back in Syria, we have these lovely streams, why would I bathe in this little mucky thing? Seven times, okay, okay, so he goes and does it. It seems ridiculous to Naaman. And the same is true for the Samaritan, how so? Well, first of all, most of you know, but a good refresher, the, Israel, the Jewish people at the time of Jesus hated the Samaritans. They didn't want anything to do with them. The Samaritans, in their minds, were descendants of interbreeding between Hebrew people and pagans, and they created a kind of amalgam religion of bits of Judaism and bits of other stuff and sort of threw it in a prehistoric blender, if you will, and came up with a religion sort of cocktail that wasn't either fish nor fowl, it was something of its own. So they considered them heretics, for one, and they were foreigners, number two, because they were descended from pagans. And they really didn't want them in the promised land. And if you touched them, you were ritually unclean. They were gross in most people's eyes. But this Samaritan is cured. But Jesus tells the Samaritan to do something the Samaritan would think is ridiculous, which is what? Go and show yourself to the priest. Why would he do that? The Jews want nothing to do with the Samaritans. He would never do that. And the priest wouldn't even want to touch him because he'd be impure if he did so. It's ridiculous. And every little village had priests. Remember, a, a Jewish priest is a male descendant of Aaron. There's no ordination ceremony or anything. It's not the same as a rabbi. It's a priest. There were lots of them. Don't show yourself to the priest. What? Makes no sense. But he goes and does it anyway. And it's that one who recognizes that he needs to give thanks. Not the ones who had the tradition of Israel. No, it's the Samaritan who did. It was Naaman the Syrian who did. He wasn't an Israelite either. Leprosy. What was that about? Well, it made you ritually unclean. 
if you had what is commonly today known as Hansen's disease, and there were other things that were thought to be leprosy at the time. For example, uh, eczema or some kind of skin rash, they would think you've got leprosy. So you have to be careful when the term is used in the Old Testament. But let's say they had Hansen's disease. Well, that means your flesh is rotting while you live. It stinks. Okay? Think of you left the ground beef in the refrigerator a week too long. Yeah. Kind of nauseating, right? That's how it smelled. It was gross. Okay. And we can understand why people wanted to get away from that. And even in the time of St. Francis, if you move up into the 1200s, people were terrified of leprosy. They didn't want to catch it. And they would do searches in the towns. And if anybody had some kind of skin disease, they would yank them away from their family and haul you off to a leper hospital outside the city walls. And you had to stay away from everybody. Think of what that was like. How alone you became. How alone was the Samaritan leper? He was ritually unclean, he smelled bad, and he was a Samaritan on top of it. Ugh, you can't get any more lonely. That's what happened to these people. St. Francis had a very hard time with lepers when he was younger. He had everything he wanted. He was rich and kind of spoiled. And life was good and easy. And he would give alms to lepers sometimes, but he would be sure to hold his nose because they smelled. Okay. And let, of course I'd let them know, uh, you leper, by the way, you stink. You know, Here's your money, but you really stink. Stay away from me. Okay. But one day, he had a conversion experience when not only did he give the alms, but he kissed the leper. Aha! It broke open. Something in him began to churn, and this was a major turning point in his conversion experience. I ask you something similar. What would be a major point of turning in your conversion experience? Think of who lepers might be to you. And you can start with something easy, relatively easy. Anybody here know somebody with a difficult personality? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, how about just being nice to that person? You don't have to be bosom buddies, but can you be of some kind of level of friendship or courtesy? A lot of people don't do it. They let the other person know they don't like them. You stay away because I don't like you. How about changing that? Not so easy. Then try it on something bigger. Kids in school. All of you know who the cool kids are. That means you know who the uncool kids are. What are you willing to do about that? Hmm. Bigger stuff. What are entire groups of people you don't want around? Where are you going to go with this? How do we heal? This is our job as Christian people. If we are living the body of Christ today, how are you going to do healing ministry? That's the point of the story. It's not to say, wow, Jesus was so powerful and he did this 2,000 years ago and isn't that great. It's what about you today, now, in this place? How will you forward the healing ministry of Christ? I can't answer that question for you. But I can tell you, the healing power of Christ is like a clear mountain stream, isn't it? In a desert. And it doesn't get mucky as it goes out farther and farther from the source. It stays beautiful and pure and rushing and flows over us and washes us clean of our sin. The, the wretched smell of sin, it, it wipes us out, wipes it out of us, cleanses us. That's what baptism is about. It gives us a new birth so that we become a new creation. It's more than a symbol. It carries a reality with it. It is that Christ is the strength. <coughs> Christ is that stream of healing. How will you be that kind of stream of healing for people today? As I said before, I cannot answer that question for you. Only you can answer it. Take a look at it this week and name it. And say, what will you do? 
and then return and give thanks to the God who gives us that gift of healing in Christ.